The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials in ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. If you want to learn to paint plein air, the video we've got for you today is one of our best and one of our most complete. John Cosby, Painting Plein Air. Hello, my name is John Cosby. I'm going to be painting here on the coast of Maine today. And uh, I've chosen a subject that is going to get better as the sun goes down. So. That's something I'm always thinking about when I'm trying to find a place to paint. And uh, Maine is a great rich area to paint in. I also like the coast of California, but uh, this, it doesn't get any better than this as far as rich subject matter. So I've got a neat little town here of a lot of old docks. And uh, in choosing a painting, what I'm looking for is a design. <clears throat> and uh, I think of that first. And then I see if the design is going to get better and the light's going to get better as the day progresses or if I'm going to be painting away from the painting. In other words, I'm trying to make the painting get better as I go into the painting. So if the, if the uh, sun was going to change and the shadows were going to go away, it looked like in a half an hour, I would lose that effect right about the time I would need it. So what I'm looking for here is a, a scene that um, will get better as the sun goes down. So I've got it. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about color. Uh, my method of mixing color is uh, a three color method and I want to show you how I think while I'm mixing color. So I've got, if I mix two colors together, I get a product, right? Like blue and yellow, I get a green, nice bright green. I can make it bluer by adding more blue or I can make it more yellow by adding more yellow, of course right over here. But what if I want to gray it? I've got to use one, I've only got one other color to use to gray it and that's the red. And if I put the red in it, I get a nice gray green like that. And I can, I can put other colors back into it of those two. I can warm that gray green up just a little bit with some yellow or cool it down with some blue, but it makes for a really simple, Look at this avocado color I got here. But it's in harmony with this cool, and it's in harmony with this lighter cool. And, this, and a lot of people have a hard time with temperature of color. They don't understand what's warmer and what's cooler. Everything about color is relative, just like everything about painting. So in other words, it's warmer than the color next to it, or it's cooler than the color next to it. So I also want to get a grayer version of something. So using that other color idea works really well. So let's do another uh, mix here. I'm going to mix purple out of my yellow and my red. I mean my uh, <laughs> red and my blue. <coughs> Don't listen to what I say. Just do what I do. Okay, so there's a nice purple. Now if I want to make that a grayer purple, I can certainly make it bluer or redder, that's simple. But if I want to make it grayer, all I have to do is take the other color off to the side, like that, so I can show you the difference. And I got a nice gray purple right there. Isn't that nice? So, and it's still all in harmony. Now look how it's moving over towards the green here. That's because there's blue in there. And when I put the yellow in, I'm moving towards green. So it's completely circular. I can pull this pile of purple all the way back to where it's a gray yellow. I couldn't get a completely pure yellow again unless I just, you know, completely cut the blue out of it or the red. 
I need both out. But anyway, that gives you the first idea of the way I mix. I'll be going over this over and over and over it while I'm painting and talk about warming the color, graying the color, pulling it this way and pulling it that. But I needed to introduce it first. The scene I'm going to paint is uh, got some value. Uh, I'm going to mix the value piles for it now. <clears throat> and what I'm looking for is about four value piles. Sometimes I'll go as many as five. But I'm looking for a nice warm dark because underneath my house out here I have a nice warm dark. And I'm not going to take it to the darkest dark I can possibly get because I want to save that accent for the end of the painting. I'm going to lighten it up just a little bit, this whole pile. And I want to get a pile of paint here because I'm going to be painting out of that pile. It doesn't matter if it's exactly the right color. I'm just looking for a warm dark. I can always change the color a little bit. So there we go. That's to the warm side. It's got some red and yellow in that dark. <clears throat> Obviously, my blue is my darkest <coughs> color on the palette. I don't have black, uh, which is a convenience color that I do carry on my palette nowadays. But if you start putting black in everything, you lose the intensity of your color. And uh, that can really ruin a painting quick. So I don't recommend it for uh, uh, in my teaching. And I don't recommend that people carry black on their palette when they're learning about mixing color. So there we go. That's about where I want to be value-wise. So that's my dark. So I'll scoop up that pile, put it over here. Now I'm ready for my next value. What I'm looking for next is my distant hill color <clears throat> behind my building. So basically in my situation here, I've got some water, a flat plane of water. I've got the uh, verticals of both my light and my shadows. And I've got the flat plane of the uh, sky or the domed plane of the sky, uh, which uh, is I'm just going to mix one value for. But I do want to uh, get these distant hills established as a cooler, grayer version. Okay. Now I don't want this, uh, the cool distant hills to interfere with the coolness of my water. So I want to save the blue for the water in the sky. So I'm graying down those hills quite a bit. There we go. Now I'm going to mix up my sky plane, which is at my lightest value pile. <clears throat> now I'm not trying to go just exactly for a color. I'm going for tone, value, and I'm squinting to see it. My lightest value out here is going to be, as far as a big mass, is the uh, sky. but. I do have these boats to deal with. So I'm going to use a warm white. And these are just small shapes. So I want to save that warm white for my boat shapes. So the sky has to be down in value from those whites. So now I've got this, this uh, lightest light. It's got just a little bit of yellow in it and the white. So that's as light as I can go. Now I can see it on my palette. So I'm going to mix up this pile right next to it for my sky value. You can see things better if you mix it up right next to the color that you're trying to compare it to. See how that yellow and the blue make a green. I want to keep it to the blue side. And I want to get quite a bit of this paint mixed up because this sky is also going to serve as the water. I'll just darken it a little bit. Now you can see right here how I've got this preserved for the boats. Now the sky is down dark enough, but it's light enough that it still feels like sky. So that's about where I want it to be. All right. I try to keep these piles fairly uh, separated and clean as I'm doing this. Now, I'm going to get rid of this white. It served its purpose. I'm just going to put it off to the side here. Now I want to get the uh, light side of my building. And that is a nice warm green. 
So I'm mixing up a nice warm value. Just a little bit of greenishness to it. Not much. And it's a gray. And when I squint, it's lighter than these hills. This is the hill value. So I'm comparing this pile to this pile. And I'm finding that uh, that this is going to go very much in between the sky and the uh, the sky and the distant hill value. So I mix it in between the two. A little too warm, so I'll cool it down just a little bit, and I think I'm about where I want to be. Nice gray. I'm leaving it a little on the warm side because I can always influence it from there. Now, just to get our thinking on the same plane, think, <clears throat> I can make this cooler by doing what? Putting a little bit more blue into it. I can make it a little bit warmer by putting a little bit more red or yellow into it if I wanted a reddish tone, if I want a yellowish tone. If I put a bunch of white in it, it gets chalkier and chalkier. It takes less of the color, or it takes more of the color away. So I'm trying to influence it with the yellow or the red first. If I have to take it up in value, I can do that. Okay, so I'm ready to paint. When I look at design of a painting, which is a very important part of this painting process, I'm uh, deciding how I want to lead the eye through the painting. This is going to be an upside down um, shape. Uh, in other words, an L shape that's upside down. It's going to go like this. I'm put a little mark on the canvas here. This is going to, it's a high horizon in this one. And that's the design right there. This is going to pull you into the canvas here and travel you across the canvas. And I'll use another device to bring you back down. But what I'm trying to do is keep the eye in the focal area. And the focal area in this particular painting is going to be out in the uh, uh, distance, right where this building and the water and all the little shapes meet each other. I'll define that a little bit more as we go. But when you're thinking of focal area in a painting, you've got uh, a, a square shape here or a rectangular shape <coughs> and you want to keep the eye out of the center. Yeah, anything that's targeting in the center you have to have a lot of skill to make a painting interesting that's in the center. So here, 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 or here is the, uh, there's a complicated math formula that you can use but I just find uh, in the field that it works really well to here, 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 here. And uh, as long as you pull the eye off to a side and make that the most important area, you'll have something to look at in the painting. People are like, uh, we're, we're hunting animals. Uh, we, our vision, in other words, developed to focus on one thing. Everything else in peripheral vision goes off and fuzzes out. So a painting should do the same thing, in my opinion. It should be looked at, it's gonna be looked at by other people, so you want a focal spot in the painting. Uh, if you make everything crisply in focus, or drawing for attention, then basically uh, if a deer looks at it, uh, a prey animal, they're going to really enjoy it, but people aren't going to get the same benefit of looking at it. It's not going to feel as real as the way, because we look at things in a particular way. So when I paint, I try to follow those thoughts into my painting. So with that in mind, uh, and since my focal area is going to be right in this area, I'm going to put my darkest dark that I'm going to be using in this value pile <coughs> down first. And it'll be right about there. So there's my beginning of my painting. Now I know that it's, it's a little bit on the low side. This travels up, this dark, and it goes all the way up above the horizon line, right about there. So that's my first thought on the painting. And then uh, th this particular building that I'm looking at has a dark shadow that runs all the way underneath it. So, I'll get that going too. Scrub that in. Connect that to the edge. Now in the finish phase of this painting I'll be talking about lines going off the canvas and all that, but I, we're not going to have to worry about that yet. I'm establishing my horizon line high in this because I want to feature the water more. Get a lot of this dark paint down here. 
because I'm going to be painting back into that. Now, uh, this line is going to come down. This is a little dock that's going to come down. I'm just going to kind of sketch that idea in and put this other dark out where it meets the front of this boat. And then there's a dark out here that meets the back of this boat. So I can get these sketched in. And now I'm ready for my, uh, there's another dark that happens up in here, but it's very small. It's on a little dock that comes out, so I'm not even going to bother with that now. Small shapes I save for the end. I want the big shapes first. I want to get this whole canvas covered with big relative, color relative shapes. Shapes that mean something to each other. I want it to say sky, building, water. So, right in back of this building, I've got my horizon line. So I'll sketch that in. It's very, very blue the way I have it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna gray this down just a little bit more. I wanna keep it right in that value, but I'm gonna gray it off just a little more than it is. Not gonna change the whole pile, because I, I do want some of those blues. But see how that's a little bit grayer version? Okay, now I can sketch in my, uh, my whole shape back here. This is my distant hill. This is a very fun way to paint too, because you've already made decisions that mean something to your painting, value-wise. In other words, you got good values. Okay, so there's my horizon line. There's uh, the hint of some mountains back here. This travels through this building, so I'm gonna <clears throat> put in this side. And then I've got the value of uh, the building itself and the sky to deal with. So I'm gonna get the sky in now. I'm gonna take a different brush. I want a nice clean sky here and get this sky value laid in. Now, since I saved the white, I'm, I can paint with quite a bit of confidence knowing that I've not gotten too light or too dark up here, so I'm keyed correctly. They want to save some clouds or something. Uh, but this is a demonstration, and I want to really get into covering the big masses the way I do when I paint, so I can get it all relative. Now, the water is darker than the uh, uh, the water's darker than the sky so here's my house shape in general that I'm preserving there okay so the water's darker than the sky so all I'd have to do is go into this sky color and get put a little bit more blue in this and a little bit more gray which I can pick up out of any of my other colors over here and you can see now I'm controlling, I'm mixing here, not up on my palette. So I've got now a darker version of sky. So I'm automatically getting a, a nice grayed down version of the sky that harmonizes with it for my water note here. And there's not a lot of water that shows because there's a lot of boats out here uh, in, the, in the background. But I'll just put in a few notes here so I know. Now look, this already says distant hills, sky, water, and the dark of the building. So I'll set that brush aside. I'm going to go back to my uh, building now. I'm going to take my building value, the, the value that I reserved here for the building, and I'm going to uh, sketch the rest of the building in. So there's the front wall. It's not exactly the color that I'm looking for yet, but it's darn close. I'm looking for the value. And then this comes back down like this. I can just sketch in a nice big flat shape. Not worried about preserving the windows, nothing like that. Okay, so what I'm really trying to be careful about now is placement of this building and placement of those shapes out there. 
making sure that all these big values that I'm placing in are exactly where I want them to be. I can make micro adjustments, but I, I can't make huge adjustments after I get them down without the painting will look overworked. So I'm trying to get it as close as I can. Don't need any detail. All I'm looking for is the big stuff. But now I can see that I did, there is an overhang here. I'm going to get that dark in before I pollute it with something. That's a nice shape in this building. And I'll play these back and forth just to soften that edge a little bit right now. Now the reason I want to keep these really big shapes is because I'm going to colorize those shapes, make the colors uh, more interesting. Now there was a boat that pulled up to the dock that I really would like to use that's now pulling away. So since I'm plein air painting out here, <coughs> I want to get the shape of that boat before it actually leaves, which I didn't quite get, but it's out here just like this. Okay, I have another boat pulling in, which is cool. This adds a little local color, so I'm going to put a few of these uh, brighter dots in here. And uh, as long as these boats are pulling up here, I can use, use them. And I think these are working boats, so they're not going to be here forever. So I'm going to go ahead and get this boat nailed down its shape. There we go. So nice, simple uh, shape of that boat. And there are many boats behind it, but uh, this is the one I'm concerned about. So, got it. Now, because it's gonna leave, I'm gonna just put, uh, ex uh, go ahead and carve a little bit into this to make sure that I get the shape correct while it's sitting there. And I'm just going right into my piles to carve this shape out. There. It's a slightly lighter uh, background there than I have. See, these are darker than, than the background here. And this gives my bow a shape. And now I'll go back and get my uh, bow carved like that. Now, the only time you really have to get off track like this is if you're, if you're doing something that's going to move. You want to get it in there. Now I have my boat. Now it has a, a dark uh, line down here and all that uh, is very important, but I'm just going to place the dark and I'll be carving back into that. So now I've got the shape of my boat. That feels like it. It's got windows and all kinds of things going on, but um, I don't have to worry about that yet. This is slightly narrower than I have it, so I'm going to carve that down because authenticity matters. And then this, this bow comes exactly straight. So now I go back to my value piles, because that's what I'm really concerned about here, is getting these all completely correct. I have a little boat sitting forward here, and I have a green boat that's out here, a very odd-shaped green boat. So I'm going to leave the green boat out. It's not a shape that I think is going to be easy to describe in this painting. And lots of times you have to make decisions based on things like that. What to leave out, what to put in is important in a painting. So, I'm not going to put the green boat in, but I do need to play this shadow, or in other words, this building, down into the water. So I'll grab the uh, building color here, the, the value of my building. I'm going to darken it down just a little bit and gray it. And I'll, because uh, when a shadow goes into the water, or I mean when a reflection reflects in the water, a shadow is lighter than it's, what it's reflecting, and a light is darker than what it's reflecting. In other words, anything that it's reflecting is degraded. The shadows become lighter, the lights become darker. Okay? Simple concept. Always works that way. It's one of the few things in paintings that's an always. So if I just simply bring the light of this building 
down like this. That's the light part. And here's the shadow part. I can go into my shadow uh, color, lighten it up just a little bit, and I can get my, there's the shadow. Isn't that simple? And, and reflections always come straight at you too. A lot of people see them as curved for some reason. I don't know what that is, but I get a lot of students who, who paint them in as curves. Now this entire underneath the, uh, uh, you know, the reflection underneath the, the, the pier here, this is out on a pier, is going to be this darker value of shadow also. So I'll get that in. So I'm pulling things towards me. Notice that? I'll put the paint in sideways, but then I'll pull it down because that's the way reflections work. They, they come straight at you. Okay, so now I feel like I have, <clears throat> and I'm standing and looking at these big shapes, going, yep, feels pretty good. About like that. Okay, so you can see now in this early stage, if I drop dead here, somebody's going to come up to this painting and go, oh, he was painting that building right there, which is my aim. As early as I can get going on a painting and make it start acting like that scene and looking like that scene, I can always put in detail, but it's hard to capture the actual reality of the scene unless you're standing here and get these values right. Okay, so my boat is going to reflect ever so much dark uh, ever so much uh, darker than this light so i can go into my little white color here put a little bit of the sky color value over here and look at that i'm going to make it a little more yellow don't want it too cool cuz if it's too cool it's going to compete with the wa the water reflecting the sky i want it reflecting this this boat that's about right, right there. Put a nice simple wash of that in. And that's where the house on the boat sits. That's about right for that value. And then of course the sky reflecting is real simple to uh, uh, add a little bit of blue to my sky to make it the water value. Now, water reflects the sky that it's reflecting, and that's, I'm saying that specifically because lower in the sky is a, is a lighter sky, higher in a sky, unless there's clouds or, or some anomaly in the sky, will be darker. So I'm going to colorize the sky and make it darker up on the high end, and it'll stay warmer and, and uh, lighter on, down by the, the uh, mountains. But it's also this the water is going to do the same thing as it comes down it's reflecting the sky up here when I'm looking down at it and it's reflecting the sky out here when I'm looking this way at it so it's got a change value as it comes towards you so it'll be a little bit darker so up here by this boat it's certainly going to be darker than out there I gotta gray this just a little bit but I want to keep it on the on the blue side Okay, that's about the value I want. See how it, see how it's starting to make that boat feel like it's reflecting there? There we go. There's boat reflection. Okay, so we basically have a blocked in painting. Streamline Premium Art Video presents John Cosby, Painting Plein Air Impressionism. Artist John Cosby is known internationally for finding captivating subjects in everyday locations that others might overlook and turning them into masterpieces. His keen eye for composition brings his scenes to life, and his use of bold color and energetic brushstrokes have made him one of the most sought-after painters by collectors around the world. In this video, you'll watch John's step-by-step -step techniques for capturing the essence of a scene 
You'll learn his techniques for composition, how to properly start a painting, and the step-by-step process to finish it, including the final finishing touches, which really bring it to life. You'll learn new techniques which will delight even the most experienced painters. Plus, you'll step inside the mind of the artist with an in-depth interview about his inspiration and feelings and why we paint. And you'll see an exhibit of his work. Learn to bring your paintings to life. Painting Plein Air Impressionism with John Cosby, part of the Plein Air Painters of America series from Streamline Premium Art Video. Well, that was John Cosby and Painting Plein Air, one of our most complete videos on the entire Plein Air painting process. And you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, there's a special discount code for you today only. You can find it in the comments section. Now let's get right to our interview with John Cosby. What I wanted to do tonight is to understand a little bit about why you do what you do. Why do you paint? And let's get a little bit the background behind it. How did this all start? You, were you born with a paintbrush in your hand? Well, I kind of was. My grandmother was a painter, so she learned from the early masters in Laguna Beach. She took workshops on weekends. What was her name? Mary Cosby. Okay. And she wasn't a professional because of her generation. She stayed in the house and raised children. And, but she loved painting. It was a passion. So and who did she learn from? She studied with Sam Hyde Harris. And she studied, uh, I think she studied with Edgar Payne because of something I found that was written, but I'm not sure that, she, I didn't get that directly from her. So anyway, it was a direct lineage. What a great legacy. Yeah, yeah. She came to Laguna very early and with her girlfriends, they'd drive down. So they, they were doing workshops at that time, you know, to kind of recover from, basically it was around the end of the Second World War that uh, she was down there a lot. And late 30s. So she influenced you. Mm -hmm. She babysat me two to three days a week, and uh, she was a pretty loving person. So she kept me close, and uh, the best way to keep me close was to have me paint with her. So she just gave me a piece of canvas and paint and a brush and said, "Here, do what I'm doing." And so I got to, I got, I lost my fear of, or I never gained a fear of uh, creating. You know. With paint. So you were, so. what, two, oh. three years old? Oh, yeah. My first painting I have. She brought my very first painting that I'd done with her to my first big art opening that I had. And I'd sent a limousine for her. And uh, she got out of the limousine with this painting over her head. And I was just like, oh, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how cute. wonderful. Though. What Everybody a great loved memory. It. Everybody loved it. It was a great memory. Well, that's and, neat that your grandma got to come to your first art opening, and, being an and artist. And it sold yourself. out, and yeah, it was really cool. I was really glad it happened. Nice. It, it was uh, something she was very proud of. So I got lucky, you know, having that, because I didn't have any art school. Uh, I worked in Washington for a while, and when I was there, I did cartoons. Uh, I always liked cartooning, mm -hmm. and um, I always drew. Drawing for me was a, a chance to look in girl magazines and things like that. My mom would let me have them if I, because you know I couldn't have a live model. So I said, "Well, I gotta, gotta have a magazine." <laughs> <laughs> so that worked out well in high school. And then uh, when I went to Washington, I did cartoons for the White House newspaper. And um, and after I left Washington, I started in boating, and uh, I sailed from. I rebuilt a boat in Massachusetts, and I would sail the Bahamas each, up and down each season uh, for three and a half years. And to make a living on the way, I would draw other people's boats and trade them for things that I needed. So wow. That worked out really well. Yeah. And in that, you know, doing that, I met people who owned um, different newspapers, and they'd have me draw things. And then I got a job with the penny saver drawing houses hmm. for uh, their ads. And then when I finally settled down um, back in California, uh, I drew, um, I started drawing for businesses. I figured out that businesses needed yellow page ads and stuff. So I went to the 
business directors association meeting and everybody that stood up was a banker or a real estate agent or something. But I stood up and said, I do yellow page ads. And it was just like <laughs> the whole room came over to me and because they, they thought they could get it done reasonably. So I started getting a whole bunch of commercial work. And within six months, that led to a really big, cool illustration contract with in and out Burger. Uh, which is a big hamburger chain on the West Coast. Love in and out Burger. It's the best. They gave me the chance to develop uh, their whole, I did their logo and I did, uh, did you really? the whole tropical The one look. they're using now? Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, the arrow. They had a round arrow and old fashioned letters. And I turned it into a surfboard. So it had a line underneath with a little skag and then the arrow coming up and then the big letters. And um, anyway, it was successful, and uh, they had me illustrate a lot of their early T-shirts. So I did these cars driving through puddles and reflecting, you know, in the puddles and stuff. So I did a lot of their T-shirts and lap mats and stuff like that. So that with that, of course, led to all kinds of other fun things. Well, that's pretty cool. It was. It was. So that was the beginning of my art career. And in fact, he, Rich Snyder, who died, um, unfortunately. Uh, who owned in and out Burger was the first one to buy my landscapes because he walked into my studio and he said, who paints all these beautiful landscapes? And I said, well, that's what I do for fun. And, and he said, well, can I buy them? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he bought them all. So that gave me the seed money then to tell him that I was no longer an illustrator. <laughs> <laughs> So that worked out pretty well. It'd be nice if you had royalties on that logo as many times yeah. as it's been used. He offered me so much money to do it that I said, you know, they, they, that's the way they do everything. All the illustrations I did for them was a flat fee, and it was very, very, very generous. So I was happy at the time. I mean, it, the, that logo, I think, paid me uh, enough to live for 10 months. And at that time, you know, my expenses weren't that high, but... That was a lo long time to be able to just go have fun. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you've been having fun for a while. Yeah, yeah. I'm a professional fun haver. And, <laughs> <laughs> and that's really what I was looking for in life. I, when I was with the government, um, I was only there a brief time, but I met some really cool people. And one of them, Henry Kissinger, told me on a trip overseas once uh, to find the thing that I most wanted in life and to live it with all of my heart. That's great advice. It was great advice. So that's what I've always done. Now you, you uh, humbly have talked about some of the other people that you've met. Uh, Richard Nixon, you worked with Nixon and got to know him intimately. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from him? Well, he wasn't a popular man at the time I knew him. He was being, he was being, uh, you know, he was, he was in the middle of Watergate when I met him. And to see how he kept his dignity uh, in spite of everything, he was totally humiliated. The thing he wanted most in the whole world had been taken, and then it was ten times worse than he could possibly imagine. And uh, to watch him hold his chin up was, I learned a lot from that. Sure. that that was probably the biggest, uh, the biggest single lesson. But, you know, every day to watch a man... Um, uh, any, any, any of those people at that level, to watch the way they live their lives, if they do it with, with uh, fortitude like he did, it was, it was always really impressive to watch because the weight they carry on their shoulders is so immense. And you told me you met and knew Anwar Sadat mm -hmm. and that you became pretty good friends. Well, I wouldn't call it friends, but um, I was professionally, I was only 18 years old when I met him. So that was quite a... Uh, I was a little boy, and, and older men are easily you know, influenced by youth, I think, and they feel safe. And he would be very, very kind to me and speak to me in really nice terms. And So I was only professionally working with him, but that would, uh, I'd be in the room with him for five minutes, you yeah. know, so just delivering a message. <laughs> but anyway, it was a good part of my life, and uh, it influenced me a lot to to carry on with, uh, you know, whatever talents I was given and, and make the very most of them. So you've, you've had a chance to, to do what you do now for quite a time, quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that keeps you doing it? 
Um, well, the thing literally that has kept me doing it, I think, the longest has been um, I refuse to just paint what was selling. And because the trap with a professional artist is that if you hit on something, and I've hit on several things along my career that I could have sold all that I could have painted of it. For instance, I painted a, a cigar uh, for a cigar dinner once in Hawaii. And a guy named Marvin Schenken, who owns Wine Spectator magazine and, and uh, a couple other magazines, he owned Cigar Aficionado magazine, happened to be at the dinner. And he bought uh, all of those paintings and what they were is they were a portrait a portrait of men they were all the stuff that you throw out from your pockets on the desktop on the end of the day and a glass of wine and a cigar or a glass of scotch and a cigar and different people's keys and wallets I had all my friends lay out their stuff and I painted their portrait on a tabletop well because you can't really in this day and age have your portrait hanging over your fireplace like we used to be able to do it was a way that a woman or a man could have a portrait of themselves uh, without looking to, you know, th there's not a lot of professions that you can have a portrait of yourself. Uh, so I could have sold a million of them. And the money was really good. I was asking, you know, the top dollar for them because I didn't want to do them all the time. So anyway, I could have done that forever, but I would have been bored to death. Right. Or I could have painted uh, boats. That's all I painted for a long time. And I could have stuck with it because I had a real yachting crowd that was very interested in my boat. But the more I found the more I painted something, the more I became repetitive and the more I became stale. And so my painting actually went down rather than up. And this is just maybe me, but I have seen other artists who, who get trapped into their own success. Success is literally your worst enemy as an artist, I think. Uh, it creates all kinds of problems. Um, unfortunately, we need it uh, to keep going, but you can um, become very weakened by it. If you, if you just think of this example, you have a body of work you've been painting and it gets really good and say you have 40 paintings that are really good and then you sell them all out in a show. Now you've got no paintings and you may have gotten enough money to live for a while but all of a sudden you have to kind of start over again and build up a body work, but each painting starts selling real quickly then. Well, that's real success. That's what all artists dream of. But what do you really end up with then is no body of work anymore. And you end up trying to keep up and now you got to track frames and which galleries they went to and maybe you're not good at that. And then you got to develop an inventory system and you're not good at that. You want to paint. So pretty soon you start doing all this stuff trying to keep track of your success. Now you're not much of a painter anymore because you don't get to paint. So I've seen many artists succumb to this problem. And I was lucky enough to have been raised in a retail family. So I knew how to keep track of my inventory easily. And I knew how to you know, buy product and get it delivered easily and ship. And, but uh, uh, the problem that I had individually is what I had to address. And that was boredom uh, with the subject that I was most known for. So I just tended to pick more and more difficult things that were over my head and work on those in my spare time and try my best. I didn't go to art school, so I just try my best to learn, you know, from the, and be around the best people I could possibly paint around and uh, listen to them. Don't be threatened by them. Who would you like to have painted around that you never got the chance to? Um, well, I think I've gotten to paint with most of the artists now in America that I really enjoy uh, their paintings. Um, as far as dead guys, well, it's really easy to say Soroya would have been wonderful to paint with the guy. Watch him. You know, the stories I hear were quite something. And he was a big influence early in my life because he influenced my peers. I was very influenced by a guy, by a guy named um, Marco Sassoni. He was an Italian who had come to California and painted in a beautiful style for the 70s and uh, became a legend in that area and did really well, made books and he was a cool guy. And he's still painting actually, he's in Canada. But um, that influenced me and then there were no galleries selling anything then in representational work. So I didn't know how I was going to actually distribute my work, so I opened my own gallery. Hmm. Um, and then I got to know other artists through that too. And I found that Galleries are a funny thing, you know, you, you have uh, success in your gallery 
or sells in a painting, you know, your painting style sells well, and then every gallery wants you. But if you don't have any sales yet, no, no gallery wants you because you're not proven. So you have to win awards or do something. I didn't know there was no contest. So I couldn't go win awards that I could, you know, 30 years ago that just, it was all about modernism. Right. So I opened my own gallery. I sold all the paintings I could paint because I was the only one of the gallery in Southern California to speak of. So it was an early success, but it, it wasn't warranted. I mean, in my opinion, the paintings were uncooked. I, I had a long ways to go. And I didn't even know that. I just knew there was something <laughs> very strange that I could just paint something and just sell it so easily. And, uh, you know, pretty soon I started meeting people like Kevin McPherson, the early pioneers in the plein air world. And he pointed out um, kindly that I had a few things to learn. And uh, so I set on that track. I'm a lifelong learner. I love learning. So when I... Um, meet somebody who's got something that I want to know. I don't like try to suck it out of them, but I do try to make myself available in case they want to give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> or if I can buy it. <laughs> so so um, we have a lot of people watching this video right now who are trying to get to the next level, maybe trying to get to any level. Mm -hmm. um, you work with a lot of students, mm -hmm. or you have over the years. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think are the most important uh, messages that you can send these people? Well, one is it's the process, not the destination. It's the trip. I mean, that's what's really joyful about being an artist. And people forget that. And it's a bad thing to forget. You've got to pay attention to the road you're on. And finding your road is the, therefore the, the, the thing you need to look for most. And I find that what people are naturally attracted to in other people's paintings, they'll drift towards. And so if you are drifting towards, say, Matt Smith or John Cosby, find out if that person is a good teacher and ask them questions. Attend something that they're doing, a seminar, a, a workshop, something like that. I didn't have those available to me when I was younger, but had I had it, I would have jumped right to the point where I'd know what kind of brushes to buy, for instance. I, did, I couldn't figure that out because you go to an art supply store, they sell you what's on sale. You know, they don't really know. They're not painters. Uh, so those are the little beginning things that are really important. Uh, find the people that you admire and look at their work and spend time with it. And then also spend a lot of time in museums because you can see the same painting a hundred times. And every level that you achieve in your own painting, you'll see something different in that painting. And that's what makes life as an artist so interesting is you learn to see different. And you learn to see different than anyone else at a different pace and you're in a different place than everyone else is at a different time. And success, success as an artist is not monetary. It has, it's, it's fact, it's, I think it's one of the worst aspects of our business. Uh, it's an unfortunate evil. <laughs> I don't mean to be too down on it because I do like money. But, and the things that it brings. But what I really want the money for is just so I can go on painting. I don't really need a Ferrari or a limo or anything. Um, I prefer life in uh, the hood so I can get more rich uh, accoutrement to paint. But um, I, think, I think if you uh, measure your success in what you're learning, look back, keep track of your work, uh, keep a flow going and always have a plan. What I do every year, I try to take s some type of a lesson uh, time out for myself, even as a professional artist. Um, I take 10 days at least every year and I go find somebody, or during that year I've been watching and I find somebody who knows something I don't know and I'll go either take their workshop, uh, I mean some of them are very embarrassed that I'm in their workshop or sitting there because they, they just like, I'm not gonna, <laughs> what do I got to tell you, you know, at this point, but they do. I'm there for a specific reason. Right. And I have no pride with this. I'm there because I want to know what they know. And once I learn what they know, then I, I don't use it like they do usually. Uh, but I can use it in the way that I, I have that question for a reason. I've give, arrived give me an example. Of... Well, I went and took Joe Paquette's workshop because even though I paint with Joe Paquette all the time, uh, he gives me the, the, the uh, abridged version of his uh, color theory that he learned directly th from basically the lineage from Dumont. And he's one of the few people that really knows how to teach it. Mm. 
So even though I painted with him all the time, he would talk all this color theory. Well, I don't know anything about, ser I didn't know anything about serious color theory and, and exactly why color moves through a spectrum like it does and how does it apply to a palette. I thought that'd be really cool to know. Yeah. So me being a, basically a three color kind of guy, I, I was like, wow, how, how do you expand that into a, a, a intelligent process uh, of, of walking out into the distance and of painting. And so I went and I took his workshop. I took a 10-day workshop. And of course, a lot of the people in the workshop were not professional painters or they were in the very beginning stages of their profession. And um, I, I took a whole different thing out of the class than they did because I was ripe for a different thing. So that's a good example. One of the problems with... Um, teaching today is because of the economy and everything uh, the workshop idea has really caught on and a lot of people who can paint well aren't good teachers and uh, it's too bad because they they have a good message to deliver but they just don't pass the message on very well mm -hmm. and uh, I watch it and it's kind of you know the students are not getting what they're there for there are a lot of students out there who want to go for a social experience and they aren't as inquiring as some people who are trying to move through an art career. So I would say, look at yourself, where you are, what you want, and try to match those things honestly. Because it's real hard to be honest about where you are in your art, art world. Everybody thinks they're great because their mom put their painting on the refrigerator earlier in their life. I, ha I don't have that problem. <laughs> you beat I yourself up. <laughs> well, that's a good thing, Eric. Yeah. I beat myself up really bad, and and. Uh, but I have good reason. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> no, you know it never, ever, ever changes. It doesn't matter. I know. I'm sure you know this because you talk to artists all the time who are per, they're perfectionists. They the better they get, the better they want to be, and that that's the level that they're now jumping into the pool from. But they've got to learn something else to go to the next level or the next sure. level. Well, it's, you know, it's very intimidating for me to paint around. Painters who have accomplished a certain level of uh, success as painters, mm -hmm. not necessarily financial success, just good painters. It's you know, so you're you know, we're always comparing comparing ourselves and trying to you know get to where they are. And of course, I'm sure everybody does that. A, a very famous painter once told me he still hasn't painted uh, what he considers to be a great painting. Mm -hmm. So it's always. I'm sure striving, but sometimes frustrating for, for me and for probably a lot of the people watching, just knowing that they've just got to keep at it. I hate to break the news to my students sometimes, but I do it first day. I've gotten to where I just say it outright. It takes 15 years of painting a, a lot yeah. to become a decent painter. Yeah. There are, I guess, gifted people out there who could do it a little quicker, but I don't really know of even one. Every one of them either started really young, painting hard, or had really great training and painted hard after that. But nobody comes out of the chute drawing and painting well. It just doesn't happen. Well, and you have to get a rhythm. You know, I, exactly. I, I have certain periods of time in my life when I'm able to paint more frequently. And I start out rough, and after maybe a couple of months where I'm doing it a lot, I get a lot better. And then mm -hmm. I take the hiatus to go back to work and it gets bad again. So mm -hmm. people like you who have that opportunity to do it every day makes a huge difference, I would think. It does. It makes a huge difference. It, it, it takes that kind of commitment. I, I would venture to say that not one painter that you see out there who you really admire their work does it part-time. Right. I, I think that would be a safe, fairly safe bet. I've never met. So what are the things that, that if, if you had to characterize the great painters that you know, mm -hmm. are there other things other than consistently working it, are there other things that you think great painters have in common? Yeah, I, I think that they're tool people in general. They like device, they like to figure out methods, like they're chess kind of people, they like to figure out the moves. I'm not, I'm only using that as a metaphor, I don't mean they play chess, but they like a process. Uh, the great painters seem to be very good at a lot of things. You know, they're, they're good at music usually. Uh, they they usually play something or at least have some a real interest in music. Um, 
Uh, and then they're very, very, very tenacious. I mean, they're people who just never let go of the bone because there's so many times that you let go of the bone, another dog's going to take it from you. There's, you know, it's really a, uh, a world where you can fall behind very quickly. And the more success you achieve in your, even if it's in your neighborhood art group, and all of a sudden you're the guy who's do, or the girl who's doing the figure in the class better than anyone else in the class. Any moment someone can walk in that door who's, who, who's better than you. And you can't ever be threatened by that person. The way I look at that person, and it's just a natural gift I have, and it's why I've been able to move through my life the way I have, I think, is I'm so excited when that person arrives because now I can really learn something. Well, they're going to pull you up. Oh, exactly. It's like yeah. a better tennis player. Yeah. Or Now, do you paint figurative work? Yeah. yeah. I started a figure studio because I couldn't find one that had good figure. So uh, when I was running La Papa, Laguna Planer Painters, um, we had a space that we had an opportunity to get, and um, uh, we hired, start hiring models, and you know, Ken Oster and, and, and I and two, three other artists just pooled the, the group's money and, and got people to pay. So you know how the, the figure studio stuff works. So it made it, so it was literally across the parking lot from me, I had uh, models coming uh, every other day. So it was great, and I don't paint the model professionally, so it was a chance for me to go in and just hone my drawing skills, right. my brushwork, and then take that and apply it to what I really do, which I like figure in the landscape. All of a sudden, my figure in the landscape started selling because and being noticed because uh, people were uh, noticing that they were animated. And I could draw better. There are thousands and thousands of people who are now plein air painting. There are more events than ever. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think it's a really fabulous uh, uh, situation that's developed because, I mean, look how many people are into art now and, and representational art. When I started, nobody cared about representational art. They thought it was just some idiot thing that had been done in the past and there was nothing important about it. And so all these great paintings were going unad unadmired. Uh, you could buy an Edgar Payne, for instance, back then for literally $75. Uh, my gallery owner out in California, Ray Redfern, has a $75 Hanson Puthoff that he bought. $75. So, <laughs> good for him, but you know, to get these things admired is fabulous, and I think the plein air movement has been a large part responsible for getting great art in representational form admired again. Um, but what's funny about art, the art world is everybody thinks that art is one lump. It's uh, the art world. They think of there's maybe modern art is divided out from representational art and that's it. But it's not. There's all different levels of artists in each one of the worlds. There's some who specialize in, in figure and some who specialize in animals and all these things. Plain air is a very broad term. And because it became very popular and written about it, it was an easy thing to write about. It was very immediate. It was participatory. I was in some ways responsible for some of this, what I, I don't think went a good direction is the quick draws uh, because we started doing them early when I organized the Laguna Plain Air Painters uh, uh, event at the museum. We came up with it. We had to invent this whole thing because there wasn't really one like this uh, anywhere. So one of the things we wanted to do for the press was show them um, that uh, you, a painting could be painted in a few hours and you'd get a nice representation of something. And so this would be a chance for all the artists to be in one spot and the press could come and the school bus is full of kids and we could educate. Well, what we really did was we showed people that a painting can be done in two hours. And in, in the American mind, a painting done in two hours is not worth very much. It can't be good if it was two hours. Exactly. Even though it's two hours and 40 years of experience. It's, it's, yeah, there's some genius involved there. <laughs> <laughs> Like that great quote, Soroya. Did you hear that quote Soroya did about the, the great banker came down and says, I'll do the short story version. And he had commissioned his wife to be painted. And he said, I want to watch because I heard it. It brings tears to your eyes to watch you paint. And he says, sure, you can watch. And he, in a couple hours, he painted this full life figure of his, uh, his wife. And this banker said, I'm, I'm not going to uh, pay you as much money as you asked. That didn't take any long. And he it didn't take you very long. He says, uh, sir, you don't pay me for my time, you pay me for my genius. <laughs> <laughs> Soraya could get away with it, I can't say that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's the biggest um, 
The biggest thing I have against uh, on the negative side of the plein air movement is that art has been devalued. Uh, it's, it's known as a quick art style that is, uh, in the American mind, not worth as much. There's all kinds of different, you know, a, a, a person who knows what they're looking at can tell if the art has reached a level and a voice. And that's, that's the way I like to tell my students. I, like, I compare a lot of things to music because music has uh, exactly the same words in it even, you know, the harmonies and the, the notes and everything that art has. But uh, an artist fully develops their voice and it usually takes a while to do that. Well, you can paint a pretty good plein air painting in five or six years of trying really hard. But it's simple and it's usually looks, it's usually derivative of another painter because you don't develop your own voice for many, many years because you have to get good at that and then you, then you allow yourself the freedom to, and, the, and the skill and the confidence to develop your own voice with the flair that can come out of your own mind so you can translate. But too often people are half cooked and they go out and they enter the competitive art world it's become and it's a great thing for them but it really is not good for them because as soon as they achieve success with that style they're done growing because they're getting awards for that style. They're getting, now all of a sudden everybody wants that style that look, well, they were derivative still, or they were half cooked. So it doesn't drive them to be the genius they might have been, um, and they probably would be. Well, there are a lot of copycats out there too, and, yeah. and uh, I had a gallery owner tell me a story one day about a particular artist who was always sold out. Every time he would get that artist, he would get a red dot. And two years later, I went into his gallery and I saw that artist hanging there and it wasn't sold. I said, you told me these always sell instantly. What mm -hmm. happened? He said, well, I have 30 other artists who he has taught right. in workshops and they do work that the consumer can't tell much difference. Right. And they're a quarter of the price Close or, enough. or less. Right. And so he said, people are opting for those rather than, than the person who taught them. Right. And of course that person isn't growing and isn't changing his or her style. Mm -hmm. So there's a constant elevation required. Right. So it's, it's kind of a different area of art in a way. It's a, it's a, someone had a different career trajectory. Some career trajectories are like this in every business and some really can go up. But what drives the, the artist that, or the businessman or the performer to go to the top level? And a lot of it's just discomfort, I think. So it's not bad to be discomfort and it's not to have discomfort and it's not as an artist. And it's not bad to not win awards early. So our youthful painters that are coming through shouldn't, I mean, I think they should try to get awards. I think they should try to uh, uh, get into contests and everything. But the judges, it's such a thin pool of judges. Nobody, I don't really enjoy judging things. And the reason I don't enjoy judging is because I only make one person happy and I piss off the rest of the art world. <laughs> All those other people. And a lot of them are my students and a lot of them are friends and I don't really want to piss them off all the time. So I'll do one or two judgings a year. I'm a pretty qualified judge because I'm very fair. I, I can, I've given very abstract pieces uh, the first place award. I'm not just a representational judge. A good piece of art has a voice. It has a meaning. It, has, it makes its point. And a bad piece of art doesn't. And it's really easy to tell the difference. So... Um, Anyway, it's hard. I think it's hard to. I'm not tooting my own horn. I don't want to be a judge, so that'd be a bad horn to toot. But uh, I do uh, feel that um, more people need to step up who know what they're looking at and can be fair and judge art shows, so that half cooked art is and and derivative art is not given first place awards. If it's if they're given first place awards, it hurts the artist who gets the award. It hurts the art world in general. And uh, it, because the artist who truly should have been in that show and that was derived out of, you know, this couldn't be in that show. They were overdoing another show somewhere else. Well, that's a whole other problem. It, it, there's, there's an issue of vetting. Uh, right. There are some standards that need to occur with judging. Mm -hmm. We're working on some of those things, which I'll tell you about someday. But um, let me ask you this, because um, we're kind of on the edge of our time now. Okay. Um, when we're digging through the archives a hundred years from now, trying to dig up information about your life and understanding what you were all about, what is it that um, 
that you can tell us that we're not going to be able to find anywhere else? Well, let's see. Um, well, it's not written down that I really enjoy being a father. But uh, that's a great answer. Yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and trying to fit this into that is difficult, you know. So I don't talk about it very often because it's emotional, but uh, it's a, such a rewarding place to be that it's, it's truly art. So. Well, John, thanks for your time. You're welcome. Well, that was John Cosby painting in plein air. And if you want to learn plein air painting, this is the one that's got so much complex information simplified. I think you're going to enjoy it. You can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, we have a special discount code for you in the comments section today only. Well, thank you for watching. I'm Eric Rhodes. Streamline Premium Art Video presents John Cosby, Painting Plein Air Impressionism. Artist John Cosby is known internationally for finding captivating subjects in everyday locations that others might overlook and turning them into masterpieces. His keen eye for composition brings his scenes to life, and his use of bold color and energetic brushstrokes have made him one of the most sought-after painters by collectors around the world. In this video, you'll watch John's step-by-step -step techniques for capturing the essence of a scene. You'll learn his techniques for composition, how to properly start a painting, and the step-by-step -step process to finish it, including the final finishing touches, which really bring it to life. You'll learn new techniques which will delight even the most experienced painters. Plus, you'll step inside the mind of the artist with an in-depth interview about his inspiration and feelings and why we paint. And you'll see an exhibit of his work. Learn to bring your paintings to life. Painting Plein Air Impressionism with John Cosby, part of the Plein Air Painters of America series from Streamline.